you pack your butts down because Fat Grandma is about to put the Christ Almighty that hunk has got next back in Christmas. When you mix together a naked woman, a pair of antlers, and a serial killer, you have a terrible recipe for blueberry pie. For you got a fantastic serving of the sassiest Christmas since the whiz. Our story begins in the Midwest 2013 as the cinema snob is just about to watch his movie for a week. What the fuck just happened? Why did I have to hold my breath that long? And why was my skin a different color? I don't like this. I don't like this at all. So let's talk about the controversial 1984 slasher film Silent Night, Deadly Night. What can I say about this movie that hasn't already been said? No, seriously, what could I possibly say about this film? I already reviewed parts of it in the stock footage cool Silent Night, Deadly Night 2. And I'm pretty sure I came across parts of this movie in that stupid infomercial from a few years ago. Today we're looking at the big box VHS of Silent Night, Deadly Night. Oh look, tits, and that's the end. Do I even need to go over the controversy of this film again? Okay, long story short, housewives got really fucking bored in 1984 because they were killing time before bitching about music lyrics. So suddenly, this little movie became a hot button issue. Despite the fact that it was hardly the first horror film to not only take place at Christmas, but it also wasn't the first film to feature a mass murderer in a Santa suit. Hell, 1984 alone gave us exploding gremlins at Christmas time, not to mention a Christmas story in 1983 giving us a Santa that's even more terrifying than the one in Silent Night, Deadly Night. Ho, ho, ho. It really seems like a lot of this controversy could have been avoided by simply not taking your kids to a movie called Silent Night, Deadly Night. Even Mickey Rooney got in on this action, saying that the filmmakers should be run out of town. That is, until he later starred in Silent Night, Deadly Night 5. Which is probably a conversation that went a little something like this. Here's your check, Mr. Rooney. Oh, oh thank you. God bless. My point is that the protesting of this movie got so ridiculous that you would have thought that the filmmakers physically molested the country's children. <laughs> the fuck was that? Oh, god damn it. That's the buzzer that goes off whenever I accidentally make the same joke I did in the Silent Night, Deadly Night 2 video. Fuck. Ah, uh, children singing. The sure sign of either a horror film or a Lee Greenwood song. And I don't know which is scarier. And I find it highly inappropriate that this movie also serves as a crossover with Bruno Mattei's Caligula reincarnated as Tony Nero. Linnea Quigley? Ooh. I bet even the letters in her name have a nudity clause. This movie offends me so much that I am going to publicly name the producers of this film. Oh, uh, the producer uh, has a credit. And the store is also named after one of the producers. <sighs> Sorry. That was unnecessary grandstanding on my part. Hopefully those more professional than me didn't fall into that same trap. So, let me repeat the names of the writer and director and producers of this film. Michael Hickey wrote the film, Charles E. Sellier Jr. directed it, and Ira Richard Barmack produced it. You people have nothing to be proud of, even if you made a few bucks off of all the negative publicity. Your profits truly are blood money. Guys, what are you doing? It's like you planned that before you even saw the movie. So let's repeat the names of the people who did it. <laughs> TriStar Pictures, co-owned by Columbia Pictures, CBS, and Home Box Office. Shame on you. I agree. Setting a horror film during a beloved holiday is something they should be ashamed of. But again, it's okay when Halloween did it. Ah, Illinois. The kid's only reading The Night Before Christmas because he forgot his diehard novelization. 
I don't know why people are complaining about creepy Santa here, when every other image of Santa is terrifying to begin with. Creepy Santa is a tradition that's as old as time. Much like Christmas itself, there's a lot of driving going on, and the payoff will probably be disappointing. Utah mental facility? So, Salt Lake City? We've been keeping the Dos Equis guy secluded for months, ever since he overdosed on a mixture of heroin and interesting. Dad. It's Ellie. We have Billy here and little Ricky, too. Why doesn't Grandpa say something? He doesn't hear us, honey. Okay, then why are you the one talking to him? This is one of the many reasons why it was great being a child in the 80s. We got toys from R-rated movies, and parents would leave us alone with old men in a mental facility. Santa Claus only brings presents to them that's been good all year. All the other ones. All the naughty ones. He punishes. You know, when you break it down, what he's saying isn't any creepier than Santa Claus is coming to town. You know who watches people when they're sleeping? People who aren't normal! This is the ward that's made up of Santa, Grandpa. Another one has an old man telling them to beware the moors, and then another to warn them away from visiting Camp Blood. He instantly goes back into his coma when the adults return, which I guess means that his entire existence is just to fuck with kids when he's alone with them. This is gonna make for a very long ride home. Mommy, were you ever naughty when you were little? Mm, once or twice. I may have done undesirable things with a candy cane, yes. Grandpa's story has little Billy all freaked out, but don't be scared, son. We'll get you a good guy doll for Christmas. That'll cheer you up. But perhaps Grandpa was on to something, as Santa is seen here robbing Nick Offerman's gas station. All right, you. Harsh. Well, at least that wasn't... Overkill. 31 bucks. Merry fucking Christmas. Ah, uh, but it's $31 in 1984 money. You could buy like $31 with that now. Or maybe some new Christmas music. Santa's watching, Santa's waiting. Christmas Eve is slowly fading. I would joke that this is the third time we've heard that song in the movie, but have you ever listened to a 24-7 Christmas station? They tend to play the same songs over and over again. Fucking 93.9, bring back your regular format! Uh-oh. Uh you think we should wake up, Billy? <laughs> yes, wake the kid who's already having nightmares about the thought of Santa Claus. Ah, what's the worst that could happen? Just like real Christmas, only instead of getting coal in your stocking, it's rape. This guy is a terrible robber. He's clearly on the run from the authorities, but he takes time out to murder an entire family and terrorize this kid? Hey, you little bastard! I can see why kids would be creeped out by this movie. Probably because it's not a kid's movie! It's now three years later at St. Mary's School for Orphan Children, because if they weren't orphaned, this would be kidnapping. Also, I find it slightly depressing that Billy and his brother had no relatives on either side of the family that would take them in, <laughs> so they're at an orphanage. Already these nuns are sadistic. Look at that horrible mullet they've given him. Billy gets in trouble for hanging up a picture of Santa being murdered, which, what did they think was gonna happen? You finally have what you've been asking for, Mother Superior. Proof. Of what, Sister Mother? That it's all still inside him. Really? You're just now noticing this after he's been there for three years? Simply because something unfortunate happened to his parents, which he knows nothing about. I'm pretty sure he still has the memory. He was like five when it happened. Christ, according to the second movie, his baby brother actually has a memory of it. That was a long time ago. Can you possibly remember all that? Because I was there. <sighs> that guy would overact a fart. <clears throat> God damn it! Billy gets confined to his room, but is later told that he could go out and play. But what's this moaning going on in the background? <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, probably just that tiny man nailed to that little cross. Something Skinamaxy is going on in there. More erotic than Deep Throat. You will cream in your jeans when you see Catholic High School Girls in Trouble. And you know what happens to naughty Catholic school girls. You pay for this. We'll take your punishment. I swear I saw Jessica Lange do this same thing in American Horror Story. Although in that, it probably had the theme to Vertigo playing over it for some reason. They shouldn't be in this school anyway. They're like 25. Wait, why is he in trouble? He left your room, William. Bitch, the other sister told them he could go outside. And what's he supposed to do? Not be a peeper? Uh, hardcore Catholic schools warning children against the perversions of sex while introducing them to their future kinks. Meanwhile, it's Saint Eligius. Oh, good one, Mother Superior. Now he's going to insist that the prostitutes tie him up, too. Good lord, NBC's live version of Sound of Music is terrible. And what's the deal with all the character development in this movie? Why can't it be like the other slasher movies that start out with the mayhem? That way I could complain about that. This is screwing with my cinema snob slasher movie complaint advent calendar. And now he doesn't want to sit on Santa's lap? Well, no shit. Oh, but Mother Superior said he doesn't have any memory of his parents' death, even though he obviously does. And why is this nun so obsessed with this kid taking part in the commercialization of Christmas? <laughs> oh hey, it's what I wanted to do to Will Ferrell the entire time I watched Elf. What the hell's wrong with that kid? His parents were killed by a guy in a Santa suit. It was very stupid of us to attempt this. It's ten years later and the good nun is looking for a job for Billy. But I only have one job open. And it's for a man, not for a boy. Hey, that's sexist. Or, wait, well, it's not really sexist, I guess. There's something about this movie that causes people to get pointlessly offended for no reason. Billy, meet Mr. Sims. Oh, don't hire Ryan Reynolds. Your store will lose like a hundred million dollars. Hey, I, I kind of feel bad for that one. I, I like Ryan Reynolds. Billy is instantly hired, and he's clearly doing a good job, because only people who are good at their job get an 80s montage. On the one side of the door. God damn, that kid straightens coloring books well. He's so wholesome, he passes up booze for milk. Huh, but probably because it's only noon. This store has everything. Look, that's Jabba the Hutt. I hope it comes with amazing slave girl watching action. Uh-oh, this can't be good. Dude, you're working in a toy store. You had to have expected this. You know, what is it with you lately, Billy? When you came here a couple of months ago, you were an all right kid. But all of a sudden, you got this fucking attitude problem. Just explain that your parents were killed by a guy in a Santa suit. After that, I guarantee this guy won't give you shit about Santa anymore. Now we know what Bruce Wayne would be like if Santa killed his parents. Am I implying that Bruce would have grown up to wreak havoc in a Santa suit? <laughs> yes, I am. And with Ben Affleck playing Batman, we would finally get our Batman vs. Reindeer Games crossover. And seriously, why do people still live in this orphanage when they're old enough to run for president? Don't mind the manager. He's got to hurry up and get home so he could be Gary's dad from Weird Science. The manager is stressed out that he has no one to fill in for the department store Santa at the last minute. Might as well ask Billy, seen here conversing with the ghost of my cousin Vinny. Very realistic, isn't it, Mrs. Rand? He's definitely fat and jolly. Take a closer look at yourself in the mirror, Billy. Why would he agree to that? This is a recipe for disaster. Do you have any idea what you're doing? You're being naughty. Right on Santa's lap. I don't bring toys to naughty children. I punish them. That's right, he gives them Garbage Pail Kids toys. And why is he still quoting his grandpa? Does he actually believe in Santa Claus? He's gonna go to the news networks and claim that Santa Claus has always been traditionally white. <laughs> and a killer. Instantly, the sister feels uneasy about Billy being Santa. 
My god, I can't believe this happened in a toy store! Hopefully no drunken slasher movie parties break out. Seven o'clock! It's over! Time to get shit-faced! <laughs> Well, now I can't say that this movie doesn't have any characters that I can relate to. <laughs> Fucking ow! In Billy's defense, these toys do look like they were made by someone who kills children. A boy should think about his parents at Christmas. Good boy. They're dead. Oh, God. Oh, I'm sorry. I, f I forgot. Oi, you knew? Then why did you make him dress as Santa? No fornication. Don't listen to your inner Santa Voorhees, Billy. Wait, what's going on over there? Ho ho, nothing, 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 nothing. <laughs> well, just one more look. Who doesn't want a little alone time with Linda Lovelace in a storage room? Better than drunk caroling. Santa's watching, Santa's creeping, and you're nodding, now you're sleeping. It's 1984 and people are still singing the same damn song. I'd complain, but honestly, it's not that bad of a song. By the way, when I said I wanted Mousetrap for Christmas, I meant in real life, not in the background of a 29-year-old slasher film. And look at this, I can't believe Halloween is bleeding right into Christmas. Real convenient spot for the lights, too. A place where none of the customers can see it. And what the hell? <laughs> Christ, is the alternate title for this movie Silent Night, Rapey Night? This scene is haunting him so bad, it's reminding him of the movie Silent Night, Deadly Night. Filmmakers saw this scene and decided, hey, if we make a second one, let's focus half the movie on flashbacks to the film. And what would any of us do in this situation? <laughs> exactly! Well played, Billy. You bastard! You're crazy! Get the hell away from me! Um, you're welcome. Sheesh. <laughs> Wait, why am I frozen again? The hell, why does this keep happening to me? That mean old cinema snob is starting to get the feeling he may have made the wrong decision in picking this movie for the week. But with that filthy mouth he's been exposing to our children, it serves that snob right. Cool in the stocking ain't good enough. That snob is gonna get 20 lashings across the behind and enough soap in the mouth to sanitize Bridget the Midget. Why are you reading me this story? You hush up now! I've had enough of your sass for the evening! That's why I'm reading you this bedtime story to put you to sleep! It's one o'clock in the afternoon! Don't you talk back to me now, or you're gonna get a firm slap across the mouth! Talking back to Fat Grandma, and on Christmas too! And where were we? Oh yeah, that snob is about to become so angry, he's gonna get envious of a decapitated sledder that he is. <laughs> Stop doing that, whoever you are! Back to the movie. What? <laughs> I don't think it counts as saving a rape victim if you kill her afterwards. He goes off to kill some more of his co-workers, not because they're naughty, but because they're in the same building. That's for not letting Gary go to Wyatt's party with Lisa. I guess I've seen worse things happen to this guy's head. It could have been struck by lightning 66 times. Wait, is that a Garfield toy? Weird, it's so unlike Garfield to go commercial. I see this lady is being punished for trying to destroy private property. Why does this toy store have that? Oh, right, 80s. It was probably right next to the charts. No victims left in the store. Let's take this outside. Sitting among us, holly hung just right, and faces bright with Christmas fever. <laughs> Kill them all. Oop, not yet though. There's sex. If uh, you don't go back to bed, Santa won't come. He's 
not the only one. Oh, Linnea, what are you doing here? You're gonna die. Two ball in the corner pocket. Mm. Nice billiards joke. I wish Martin Scorsese directed this scene. It's in the way But it wouldn't be sex in a horror film unless someone gets distracted. You out there? Woody! Kitty, kitty, kitty! Um, there's only one reason to be naked on a porch. Well, two to be exact. One, if you're dancing to Inky Dinky Doodah Morning. And two, if you're Linnea Quigley. Punish! Jesus, I don't know why people are giving so much shit to the 80s version of The Punisher. It appears like Dolph Lundgren is doing a fine job. He'll punish anything that moves. PUNISH! <laughs> uh, even in death, it looks like she's getting sexually penetrated. At least this guy got what he wanted for Christmas, Billy Zabka's face. Well, don't mind that. That's just a kinky thing she learned in Catholic school. Don't go for the poker, you idiot. Give him his milk and cookies, then he'll go away. There's only room for one James Spader in this town, buddy. <laughs> I'm starting to agree with the parents of the 80s. This kid's movie is very violent. Well, look, he doesn't harm children, I guess. He's giving her advice and gives her a present, too. Oh, great. Now Tila Tequila will do a blog post about how Killer Santa isn't all bad. Cops are hot on Billy's trail. Look, here they are laughing about why this pointless scene was later used as a flashback in Silent Night 2, even though none of the main characters witnessed this. Uh-oh, a distraction is breaking into someone's house. Stop right there! Daddy. Daddy? I'm starting to question the tradition of fathers dressing as old men and breaking into their daughters' rooms. Kids, it's dangerous to be sledding out here. Not because of the killer, but because of all of those trees. What a sill. Virgin, man. It's the only kind you'll ever get. But you're still implying that he gets laid all the time, right? Unfortunately, these kids aren't annoying enough, so they have to be replaced by even douchier teenagers. It was very hard for bullies to find sleds in the 80s. Not because they were expensive, but because the bullies couldn't actually read. Well, that's the darkest Tosh.0 clip I've ever seen. And pull your goddamn beard up! Ah, uh, it isn't Christmas until a nun is passed out drunk on a bench. I think this is the flashback that came in around the 30 minute point in Silent Night 2. It's great being a half hour into one movie while simultaneously being an hour into another. <laughs> no, like I give a rat's ass. There's 200 of these episodes. Of course some of the same jokes are gonna get repeated. In fact... All back! <laughs> I guess there's only one person left for Billy to kill. Knowing this orphanage, that Miss Piggy doll is probably given to a kid whose parents were killed by a talking pig. And I want each one of you to write a nice thank you to Santa. This may be the first Catholic orphanage that completely ignores Jesus at Christmas time. There, Santa has finished confessing his sins and he's good and ready to die. To be fair, he was walking up to a group of school children wanting to touch them. Something tells me that wasn't Billy. The kid we're looking for is 18. Will you stop lying to people and telling them that he's 18? Or you're never gonna find him. It turns out that the Santa who was killed was one of the priests at the orphanage. I don't understand how you could have mistaken Father O'Brien for the murder in the first place. He was dressed as a Santa Claus. Thank you, sister. You just answered your own stupid question. I am Mother Superior, and so far all you have done is harm. 
Well, that's pretty harsh, unless you take into account that a lot of this is the Mother Superior's fault. In fact, after witnessing all the child beatings and torture she inflicted on this kid, I'm of the opinion that she's the real villain in this film. Punish! <laughs> Yeah, 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 this is all time that could be spent killing Mother Superior. Okay, I'll give you that. Jack Frost had it coming. I don't know what I'm expecting here. I've seen the other films. I know the Mother Superior doesn't die in this movie. I guess I just always wish that this movie would end with Billy finally getting his revenge. Maybe this time my wish will come true. Dying in Silent Night 2 doesn't count because she was replaced by a different actress. Wait, I brought that up in the other video too, didn't I? Well, whatever. At least I changed the words around this time. And now we see that cliffhanger ending that sets it up that little Ricky is gonna grow up to become Eric Freeman. Naughty. Cut, cut, cut. The line is punish, you idiot. I can't believe this movie would dare spend its entire first half with character development and story. If it didn't, it would just be gratuitous violence. But instead, it's gratuitous plotting to sucker people in to seeing gratuitous violence. See, slasher films? You can't win with cinema snobs. I have so many unanswered questions about this movie. Eh, well, not really, I guess. I'm just sad because I still want to know whatever happened to Eric Freeman! I've covered three of these movies and I still don't have any answers. Wait, what's this? A horror blog post called The Horror Movie Barbecue that claims to have found and talked to the real Freeman who is alive and well and tells stories of his legendary Ricky performance? <laughs> While that article is convincing, who knows. But regardless, it is the best Christmas gift I've received in years. <laughs> yeah. Wait, the fucking storyteller is going to come back, isn't she? Yeah, yeah, I can hear the goddamn music. All right, all right, just let me take a deep breath. Okay. Get on with it! And that's the story of how the cinema snob watched Silent Night, Deadly Night. I'm your host, Fat Grandma, and you know what they say. A sassy mouth may be worth one laugh from the pea brain, but it's worth a lifetime of coal in the stocking. No one says that. You are the first person on the planet to say that. My God, I hate you so much. You hush up and brush your teeth. I laid out your Spider-Man pajamas just like you like. They're fresh and hot, right out of the washing machine. <sighs> Fat Grandma, Spider-Man is dead. <laughs> Happy Christmas to all, and to all a good slap on the mouth. Santa's watching, Santa's creeping. Now you're nodding, now you're sleeping. Were you good for mom and dad? Santa knows if you've been bad. There might be a treat for you in Santa's bag of toys. But Christmas won't be fun and... Grandpa is nothing but a crazy old fool. <gasps> Christmas time. I can tell that it's the season of giving, not just because there's snow on the ground and I'm flat fucking broke, but because I only have to review half of a movie. It's my own little Christmas gift to myself. Truly one of the more controversial horror films to come out of the 1980s was Silent Night, Deadly Night, a psychological slasher film about a man who dons a Santa suit and slays his way through naked chicks and sledders. The protesting of this film got so ridiculous, you would have actually thought that the makers of this film 
physically molested the country's children. And most of the bitchers about the movie didn't even realize that it was only one of two Killer Santa films to be released around the same time. Where were these idiots when the movie Santa's Sleigh was released? In Silent Night, Deadly Night, and Christmas Evil, it was just a nut in a Santa suit. In Santa's Sleigh, Santa actually was killing people. So with all of that controversy, Silent Night, Deadly Night made a killing on home video, and naturally a sequel was warranted. Silent Night, Deadly Night Part 2 was released in 1987, which was... Carpet Day! Huh? No! Anyway, the movie was released... Carpet Day! Huh? Really? Whatever happened to patience in internet reviewing? Can't you at least wait until I get to that scene in the review? Carpet Day! Huh? No! <laughs> that is a funny clip. Okay, fine. Silent Night, Deadly Night Part 2, like the first one, has become a legendary slasher flick. But for completely different reasons. With part one, it was the controversy. With part two, it's because of an internet meme that's the horror equivalent of it's a trap. The scene itself has over two million hits on YouTube, and that's just for one video of it. There are several videos of the same scene that are in the hundreds of thousands. Not only that, but the thing has been spoofed about as many times as the clip has been watched with such classics as Laundry Day, April Fool's Day, or even Opposite Day. Seems like the only time it hasn't been spoofed is for, ironically, Christmas Day. Christmas Day! Anyway, so let's talk about the movie that created the... legend? I mentioned earlier how I'm only reviewing half of a movie, and that's true, because Silent Night, Deadly Night Part 2 is only half of a movie. The entire first half of this flick is told with flashback footage from the first film. I don't know what's worse, when the stock footage is all clumped together at once, or spread out through the entire movie, such as the Death Nurse films. The Death Nurse films showed scenes of criminally insane, not in context to anything, because Death Nurse wasn't a sequel to Criminally Insane. Whereas with the Silent Night, Deadly Night footage being clumped together in the first half, we are seeing a narrative in the stock footage. So it's almost like I'm watching two movies, instead of half of a movie. God damn it. Christmas sucks. The lead role is played by a man named Eric Freeman, and his performance is one of the many things ridiculed about the movie. But most people have only seen that one clip, and it was a pretty unreadable line. So maybe in the rest of the movie, he's not too terribly bad. What makes you think you can bullshit your way into my head? Like every other pencil in that piece of shit! The hell? This guy's delivery is about as subtle as the H-bomb. How does one act opposite that? There you go. Just try to match his overacting with your finger. That'll give dignity to the scene. Eric Freeman plays Ricky, the little brother of the killer from the first film. Part 2 opens up with Ricky in jail, and the title card reads December 24th. And you can tell because of the green leaves and birds chirping outside the window. Yeah, I know it doesn't snow everywhere in the U.S., but nice weather does not exist in Christmas movies. A psychiatrist comes in to get Ricky's backstory, meaning he retells every single event from the first movie even though the first movie began when Ricky was just a baby. That was a long time ago. How could you possibly remember all that? Yeah, 
That's a good question. How does he remember any of that? Because... I was there. I... I can't argue with that. As we know from the first one, Ricky and his older brother Billy's parents were killed by a crazed maniac dressed up like Santa Claus. That is all we need to know from the first movie, but it keeps going. You in a hurry, Doc? Am I wasting your valuable time? Thanks, Eric. Christ, this guy would overact a fart. Ricky continues to tell the psychiatrist about Billy's experiences dealing with the sadistic nuns at the orphanage. You know, I'm quite impressed with Ricky's Peter Panning-like capabilities of remembering shit from when he was a baby, but it takes a whole new level of talent to remember events that you were not physically there for. From Billy getting beaten by the nuns to Billy working in the toy store. The only way Ricky would remember this is if the first one actually was a movie and Ricky wrote the script for it. Oh shit, we used up all the tape on the stock footage. Guess there's no more movie. I like how it even flashes back to incidental scenes, like the cops cruising around looking for Billy. It's great when you're a half hour into one movie while simultaneously being an hour into another movie. I could squash you like a bug. You don't scare me. Yes, my overacting is gonna get a hell of a lot worse. But back to the stock footage, remember the scene of the not-killer Santa mistakenly getting gunned down by the cops in the first one? It's imperative that we're reminded of that for this movie. Interesting how a movie known for its terrible acting is continuing to remind us how much genuinely better acted the first movie was. Well, since this is the end of the last scene from Silent Night, Deadly Night, are they going to show us that movie's ending credits as well? Might as well, they've shown everything else from it. Since we still don't know why Ricky is in jail, given how he was just a kid when the first movie ended, we have to see him tell us that story too. But at least he's flashing back to original footage this time. But kindly Sister Mary was able to find me a family. The Rosenbergs. They definitely did not get involved with Christmas. You know, with them celebrating Kwanzaa and all. Much like his brother in the previous movie, Ricky is constantly haunted by the demons of his past. Okay, apparently he's afraid that nunsploitation movies are gonna come bore him to death. What's interesting here is how much better the younger actor playing Ricky is. See, he's not even saying a word, and he's better than Eric Freeman. Eric Freeman can't say three words without it looking like his face is gonna explode. Let it out. Here it comes. Young Ricky gets his first taste of blood when he happens upon a date rape where he proceeds to repeatedly run over the guy with the jeep. Thank you. Ah, red car. It all makes sense now. Red car? Good point. Well, now Freeman is just openly mocking the movie. Ricky continues to tell the doctor about his troubled past. My old lady couldn't afford to send me to college. Yeah, or acting school for that matter. Ricky turns vigilante yet again and straight up murders a mafioso trying to reclaim his money. Mm, red umbrella. It's all starting to come together. But Ricky's anger starts to settle when he falls in love on the set of Lords of the Flatbush, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I almost killed you, love. Ricky and his new girlfriend Jennifer hit it off rather well, despite some awkward moments. That was my first time. I thought it was Jennifer's too. What I'm trying to say is that her vagina chews dicks like I chew the scenery. 
things start getting a little dark yet again when Ricky's thirst for blood continues in a movie theater. I can't imagine what the hell would set him off. What did you say this movie was about? Oh, it's great. It's about this guy who dresses up like Santa Claus and kills people. What? I'm holding you up, asshole. That's the first movie! Okay, now this movie is just fucking with me. Jennifer witnesses Ricky's true psychotic personality when she's confronted by her douchey blonde boyfriend in the street. Uh, it's not doing anything for me. If I want to see a blonde John Cryer get killed, I'd prefer it be the real John Cryer. <laughs> What, no thank you this time? You... Punish! Uh-oh! What? Was the... really necessary? You're taking the seriousness out of a scene that just showed a man electrocuted with jumper cables. After Ricky strangles Jennifer, this sets him off on one of the most hilarious murder sprees since that movie where the Zodiac Killer bounced an old woman to death with her car hood. Who the hell is this guy? Looks like if little Ronnie Howard grew up to become Barney Fife. I know how to use this. <laughs> it's coming. Just give it a couple of seconds. It's coming. He's got precious time left to become a perfect shot with that gun. Carpet day! Huh? No! There's your money shot. Also, let's look at this scene again. Would you ever think, just from looking at this clip, that this is from a Christmas movie? Would you think that after looking at any scene from this movie? What? The title Silent Night, Deadly Night Part 2 doesn't give away that there would be a scene of a man in sunny 60 degree weather shooting a man on the sidewalk in the middle of summer? But that's not all he does, no, no. This scene does not begin with Garbage Day, and it doesn't end there either. Bingo! I'm gonna go ahead and say it. Eric Freeman is a legend. He spends this entire sequence either cackling like an idiot or acting like a stone-faced killer. Drop it! <laughs> Seriously, who told him to act like this? Did they tell him to combine the traits of Snidely Whiplash and the Terminator? <laughs> hmm. Bummer. Now that all the flashbacks, from this movie and other movies, are over with, Ricky leaves prison, because he's killed the doctor, and as we all know, the psychiatrist is the only guard at most prisons. After stealing a Santa Claus suit, Ricky tracks down the Mother Superior, whose house number is 666. Now why the hell would a nun live at that house? It's nice and all that someone is finally getting revenge on the Mother Superior, because let's face it, she was the true villain of the first movie. We all wanted to see her die, but she didn't, and that sucked. Yet here, she finally gets her comeuppance, but she's played by a different actress. Somehow, it just doesn't feel the same, especially since we remember what she looked like, because the whole first act of this movie showed the original actress. It's like seeing a revenge movie where the villain is replaced in the final scene. It doesn't work! But at least they still make her a bitch. I am not afraid of you. Really? Not afraid? Let's back the movie up a couple of scenes. The shit in your pants disagrees with how not afraid you are. You are weak, just like your brother. Okay, now she's just a fucking idiot. The cops show up to try to save Mother Superior and oh no, it's too late. 
By the way, nun habits? Notorious for holding in blood in case of decapitation. Ricky is shot a few times by the cops, but luckily he's saved by the fact that this is a slasher film. So let me guess, that's the most many of you have seen of the movie Silent Night, Deadly Night, Part 2. It's amazing how the internet works. It can make stars out of unknown actors like Freeman and give notoriety to movies made 20 years in the past just by showing a single 10 second clip. All for a movie that wasn't even intended to come together as a whole movie. And seriously, it never really did anyway. Part 2's director was hired to recut the first film for a newer release and feature a couple of scenes of Eric Freeman telling the story as it went along. Not unlike what Fred Olin Ray did with John Carradine in Demented Death Farm Massacre. But once the screenwriters wrote extra scenes with Freeman as Ricky, the movie suddenly became a sequel, even though the new footage only added up to about 45 minutes. So that's why the 40 minutes of stock footage was added to pad out this now sequel, when it was only intended to be a re-release of the first film. Even the casting of Freeman himself was suspect. It came down between him and an actor with experience, yet Freeman was chosen because of his rugged good looks. And we must thank them for that because, let's face it, without Freeman, this movie would have just faded off into obscurity, much like Silent Night, Deadly Night Part 3. Or Part 4. Or Part 5 or that remake that has yet to actually be made. No one has been able to track down Freeman about this movie, not even the DVD distributors when it came time to record an audio commentary. Honestly, I hope the guy resurfaces someday. He made a movie noteworthy because of a cheesy two-word line of dialogue. I think I now know what we all want for Christmas this year. It's for Eric Freeman to finally come out of retirement. I don't sleep. Well, this is a colossal Christmas fuck-up. I was supposed to receive the 1980 slasher film To All a Good Night in the mail, a movie that's directed by legendary genre actor David Hess. Because when I think of good old-fashioned holiday cheer, I think of someone whose movie trademark was raping and pillaging. Instead, some jokester sent me this holiday pack of Jones Soda. Just what in the hell am I supposed to do with this? No calories. Oh, it goes along good with my diet, I suppose. Wait, it also includes a spoon? Oh, thank God! I didn't know how I was gonna be able to drink my soda without a spoon! Limited edition? Is that why it's from 2005? It may have zero calories, but I'm sure my body will just love me for drinking a seven-year-old soda. Who in the hell does that? And according to the box, this soda is just like Mom used to make. True. Mom did like to jam all of Christmas dinner inside of a glass bottle. And then she jumped off the roof. Anyway, since we don't have to all a good night, or whatever the hell it's called, we'll just have to think of something else to watch. Silent Night, Deadly Night 3 it is. So, after the tragic events of Silent Night, Deadly Night Part 2, I've never told anybody this before. Let it out. Here it comes. Yes, yes, we all know the deliciously over-the-top Eric Freeman performance. You don't have to keep reminding us. Although, it was very nice of you to show a clip that wasn't the Garbage Day clip. <laughs> so here's the Garbage Day clip. Garbage Day! Huh? No! Shooting someone taking out the garbage is now every bit as traditional as kissing someone under the mistletoe. 
Naturally, Silent Night Deadly Night 3 has some hammy shoes to fill after the Wrath of Freeman. Does it take up that challenge well? Having survived being blown apart at the end of 2, Ricky, now played by Bill Mosley, is a coma patient who wanders around silently, looking bored, with a glass brain hat on his head. It's like they said, hey, you remember that one thing that kind of made the second movie a little memorable? Freeman's Ricky? Yeah, yeah, that. Um, let's not do that. That's what you get when you hire quiet films. Does this look quiet to you? Well, what makes you think you can bullshit your way into my head? Like every other pencil neck. Damn right it doesn't. And that's why Eric Freeman needs to start his own production company. That is when he comes out of hiding. Wait, directed by Monty Hellman? Why does that name sound familiar? Oh right, he's the acclaimed cult director of such films as Two Lane Blacktop, The Shooting, Shatter, and he's the executive producer of such little-known films as Reservoir Dogs! That's sort of like seeing an Academy Award-nominated director do a Twilight film, because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter who you get to direct it, you're still working from the same fucking source material. Although I do like that this movie could be legitimately advertised as from the producer of Reservoir Dogs. Enough talking. Time to check out Silent Night, Deadly Night. Better watch out, three. Oh, sleeping? Is that how we're starting out? She's dreaming of Eric Freeman tossing vegetables into a frog's mouth. It's okay, she's waking up from her I want to be like Brooke Shields procedure. Funny enough, this is what most of the audience was doing during the film's release. Weird, yes, but better to be woken up like that than like this. Geez, if this gets any more Kubrickian, it'll be the opening scene from Day of the Dead. Oh wait, never mind, it's just straight up 2001. <laughs> that is, if 2001 were terrible and borrowed elements from Spock's brain. Crap, I don't know what happened in this room before she walked in, but it looked more interesting than everything else that was going on. Help me! You know, if I saw a man dressed like Santa Claus waving to me in an empty hallway, I would say help, but it wouldn't be to the guy dressed as Santa. Then again, he does have a shitload of presents. Maybe one of them will be that much-demanded Criterion release of Michael Cimino's Heaven's Gate. Oh, a snob can dream. I want a Barbie doll. And a bicycle. And roller skates. This is 1989. Give it a couple years. You'll want rollerblades instead. And a Mickey Mouse watch. No, I already have a set of kitchen knives! The girl is Laura, and she's woken up by Dr. Dennis Mitchell's father. Slowly but surely, he will turn her into Jennifer Connelly if it takes him five more minutes. Laura is blind, and the doctors are trying to determine if she shares a psychic connection with the comatose Ricky. She does and a blind lead character who uses psychic powers to move the movie's plot along? <laughs> Great! Cause that worked so well for Hills Have Eyes Part 2. Shit, they're flashing back to that scene from Silent Night, Deadly Night 2. You know, the part where it flashed back to that scene from Silent Night, Deadly Night Part 1. What is it, Laura? I don't know, but I feel like I should be an easily offended early 80s parent and protest my vision. The doctor has everyone working on this. This lady here is quickly typing out squiggly lines, and... Can I go to the bathroom? Help her, will you? No! I wonder if she's playing games with me. Dude, she's blind, not deaf. She totally just heard everything you said! Any minute now, the transparent hand of Pazuzu is gonna play keep away with her heart. Or they could just show more scenes from the original. I don't know why she looks like she's turned on by dreaming of a rape scene, but to each his own. By the way, this is Bill Mosley's weirdest performance. He hasn't said fuck, titty fuck, or cocksucker once. It is Christmas, however, so we can't stay in the doctor's office all day. You're going out of town for Christmas? 
Yeah, my grandmother's got a house out in the country. Good lord, if this movie ends with Ricky dressed up as the big bad wolf, that would actually be a step up. And since the lead character is blind, that means they can pad the movie out with shots like this. Plus, the killer is in a coma, so we get this riveting shot. Horrific. Can we please go back to this? <laughs> then again, we do have Dr. Smooth to carry some of the film. Her body may be young, but her soul is old. Well said, but that is so not holding up in court. And then she'll let me go as deep as I want. She likes it. Loves it. I'm sorry, are you talking about the patient or two girls who are offering to wash your car? She wants to penetrate his mind. Holy fuck! For the love of God, stop talking! Though I trust him to be around children more than I trust Polly Shore here. Waiting can certainly be a bitch, but every time she does this, she accidentally winds her watch back to 2.30. She's always late. <coughs> oh yeah, and sometimes she accidentally kills a nurse. Or at least dreams of it. She's picked up by her brother, who, funny enough, looks like David Lee Roth, even though this movie is the Gary Sharon of Silent Night, Deadly Night movies. But we do have yet another drunken Santa Claus to deal with. Hey, Vegetable! Who's your favorite singer? Perry Coma? <laughs> Ugh, that's horrible. But at least he's not off frightening children like earlier in the movie. Okay, Timmy, you be a good little boy now and take your medicine and Merry Christmas! Oh, oh. Good lord, he's just come from pushing Ralphie down a giant slide. And he's woken up a serial killer coma patient. Good one. Oh, hey, Ricky, uh, you know about the broccoli? I was just kidding. Seriously. Want a drink? No. No. No! Nice delivery there, Monty. I almost believed you were really scared of that cameraman. He even causes this nurse to squirt ketchup all over her just clean desk. Oh, I have to sit in on her therapy session now, too? I don't care about her this much! When you say you're having visions of the past, or flashes of future events, I'm not doubting you. Dr. Chair is right. Or, uh, uh, what is he right about? Who said you have to be the world's champion blind orphan? What? That doesn't sound appealing? Isn't that a goal everyone in life wants? I think they may need someone else to get killed at Grandma's house, too. So that's why brother's girlfriend, Jerry, tags along. Chris tells me you're psychic. Chris tells me you give great head. Jesus, Laura. I'm good with my hands, too. And she also gives great David Lynch nude scenes. Ricky telepathically overhears where Laura is going. But don't worry, at this speed, it'll be Labor Day by the time he catches up to them. But that's why he's got himself a set of wheels. And now it's off to Haddonfield. <laughs> hey, she's going to sleep again. I wonder what's gonna happen. I know. I do understand that it's a long way to Grandma's house, but hopefully they can stimulate these scenes with engaging dialogue. What do you expect? This is a movie that cuts away from a gas station attendant's death, only so we can hear his phone sex girl on the other line. I know you're there. I'm thinking about you. And my panties get wet just waiting for it. Ooh, if you're not a 300-pound trailer park mama sitting in a tub of chocolate pudding, then I'm gonna have to stop masturbating. Still, it does end with him getting his head off somehow. Luckily, Widow Granny managed to get rid of Gold Digger Yosemite Sam before her company showed up. And I think she's psychic too. Phone's gonna ring? 
Good thing we, the audience, saw you do that, because if we weren't here, that'd be an incredibly pointless thing for you to say and do. Wait, Robert Culp? You're playing the detective in this? Damn it, Robert! You were an I Spy! And Golden Girl! And something called the Greatest American Hero. I don't really know anything about that. But more importantly, you were in Golden Girl! That was about six years ago, the Santa Claus killer. He was really cute. Chopped people up with an axe. Oh, that's not all he did. And all you remember is just the axe? For shame! Please, someone fill him in on what he's missed in this movie. She sees what he sees. Yes, I know. You've been telling us that repeatedly for the past 45 minutes. And another thing, why is Ricky being kept alive with a Kool-Aid brain? His brain was surgically reconstructed. We brought back some of his basic motor functions so that his heart and lungs could keep working. We may have even reactivated his memory centers. Why? Why did you do that? Several people get shot every day who aren't axe-wielding serial killers who dress like Santa Claus. Or at least hipster Spock's brain. I didn't know that was a thing, but it is now. Too bad. Now they'll never find him. Laura. Hear that? Wait, wait, can you repeat that line for me? Make of that, Doc. Oh, Laura, I'm glad you played that back. I thought he said Farfignugan. She sees what he sees. Son of a bitch, stop telling me that! For a movie about a psychic, this movie sure does love over-explaining everything. I don't know where she is, but I'll tell you one thing, Lieutenant. You had better find her before he does. Yes, otherwise John Connor might not be able to celebrate Kwanzaa. Something tells me that if they did a Chud 3, this is what the Chuds would have looked like. Those are my grandchildren, Chris and Laura. That one's Laura. Pretty, isn't she? You know, she's handicapped too. They're coming tonight. <laughs> there you go, lady. Why don't you go ahead and tell the weird skullless man everything about your family? Once she gives him a present that isn't a stack of small wonder pogs, he does away with Grandma. Not that these simple minds notice right off the bat. <laughs> Careful, you two don't drown each other. You are unlikable! Something's wrong. Laura, don't go all Twilight Zone on us, please. I know, right? Remember that Twilight Zone episode where Janet Lee played a blind woman who was being stalked by Burgess Meredith in a transparent skull cap? That's a classic. But no time for that. Her brother needs to get back to beating Mad Shenna Mick. Though not before something psychic happens. <laughs> Well, that was a weird mirage that a blind person was having. Whoa, whoa, wait! Laura Herring does nudity? Oh, I, I already knew that. <laughs> Boy, do I ever. This guy could fashion another skull for Ricky using his damn chest hair. I like these scenes with Robert Culp because this is the closest that I'm ever gonna get to a sequel to Hickey and Boggs. And the weirdest thing about her watching TV right now, she thinks she's watching Manimal. right, movie. I should be watching The Terror. And this is a lot better than what she's watching later. You go to sleep now. Oh no, not now. Oh yes, my little ones, and I will show you how children discover sleep on Photo 7 where I come from. It's around this point that I just wish they made an entire movie out of Robert Colt banter. You know, you got call registry, and call waiting, call forwarding, 100 memory auto dialer. You got a stick? A what? Well, if you drive a stick shift, you need the hands-free option. That, that's a must. You know, if they ended that with him saying, I'm hungry, let's get a taco, I could buy that this is from the producer of Reservoir Dogs. Even his jokes are funny. Do you know what they call it when you get deja vu twice? A reoccurring extrasensory phenomenon. Uh, stupid. Seriously, why are we not following this guy around? Instead, I'm stuck with blind Debbie Downer here. 
And the chair should be here. Pleh. Whereas these two have actual chemistry, these characters' dialogue is made up of flubs that were left in the movie. What does your shrink say? He says it's a disequil... It's a disequil... Disequilibrating <laughs> phase of my development. Though this is very scary. Any minute now, the gunslinger is going to start randomly playing on the TV. Eventually, they do figure out that there's a reason that Grandma has mysteriously disappeared. You see, V-Tooth, even the phone is dead. It's not funny, Chris! It's because she didn't want to spend Christmas with that blind terror. Why not spend it with Robert Culp and a decapitated corpse? Red reactivates his childhood trauma. Ooh, I know that. I remember that tidbit from the last movie. Red car. Good point. Oh, why can't he talk in this one, too? Registered by the Orange Girls Association under the name of Anderson. Let's hope it's the same one. Let's hope we're not too late. Let's hope I filled up the tank. And let's hope the car starts. And let's hope this burrito doesn't give me food poisoning. But odds are they will be too late for the throwaway characters. But whatever it is... <laughs> Holy shit! It's no use. You uh, won't be stopped. <laughs> Next time, deliver those lines pretending to give two shits. But this is all the fun that goes into a very Leo Johnson Christmas. Though I don't care if they're too late, so long as we get cool scenes like this. Well, studying snakes is your thing, Doc. Stomping on them is mine. Can't he be driving towards a better movie? And yeah, speaking of snakes, excuse me while I relieve the reptile. Hey, Robert Culp just made a piss joke sound cool. We're in the climax, so here's where it's supposed to get really intense. What's the matter? Come on, Lord. And of course, nothing happens. Oh, wait, how about now, though? Wait. What is it? I don't know. Damn it! I have no interest in this film, yet I'm still figuring out ways to keep losing interest. <laughs> Whatever. I still don't care. The doctor, of course, pulls up and gets himself killed because he was stupid enough to ditch Robert Culp while he was taking a piss. And now all that's left is these two. He's dead, isn't he? I can tell you're upset. You're almost crying. Maybe now they can finally get along with each other. I'm sorry I was mean to you. That's cool. I still don't like you. And it doesn't matter anyway because Laura Herring gets pulled under the bed by a bedroom shark. <laughs> the hell, are you scared or coming? She tries to hide, but Ricky breaks through the door, not because he's strong, but because he's a killer in a slasher film. The great thing about having a blind lead character is that she can't tell that it's suddenly daylight upstairs. <laughs> Good one. A rat caused more emotion than her brother dying. But that doesn't even prepare you for what happens next. Don't be frightened, child. Use your power. Use it to do good for people. Use it for your life and the lives of others. What? Well, Grandma would have been here sooner, but she was too busy fucking Grandpa Seth from Troll 2. Use your mind like a lens to gather the light. To shine the darkness where you cannot see. Use your power, child. Uh, uh, this movie still isn't as bad as A Christmas Story 2. This could end by turning into a snuff film featuring children, and it still wouldn't be as corrupt as A Christmas Story 2. <laughs> huh, I would expect Alan Arkin to jump at her from the darkness, but that's what happens in a good movie. Not even Adam Arkin would be in this, and he was in Baby Bob. Oh, that's why she showed no emotion when her brother died. She must have known he was alive this whole time. <laughs> yeah, I'm sticking with that story. And just what is this power Grandma was speaking of? Oh, it's the power to watch your brother actually get killed and then have the killer fall on top of you while you're holding a spike. 
he survived a smorgasbord of bullets, but this spike is really what did him in. That, and it is better to just die right away, rather than have Robert Culp finish the job. Merry Christmas. Don't tell me Merry Christmas. You dig Eric Freeman out from whatever hole he's been hiding in, and then you can tell me Merry Christmas. And a happy new year. Okay, what the fuck was that all about? Is he in heaven now? And in his version of heaven, he gets to play James Bond? Why is he wearing a tuxedo? What kind of shitty Killer Santa movie is this, where the killer never dresses like Santa and puts on a tuxedo once he enters into the afterlife? The movie managed to make it to 90 minutes, mainly for padding itself out with pointless shots of walking, shots of drinking, shots of singing, and hey, she's cooking a turkey in real time. And there's standout scenes like this. That was an entire scene. And just look how long it takes him to kill Grandma. I couldn't tell what happened in there, but it took so long that I just assumed they were playing a round of gin first. That's a lot of nothing for a movie that has an exclamation point in its title. Padding your movie out with prolonged shots of people doing nothing does not make your movie better. I guarantee you no one would have complained if this movie was too short. You know, part two made me so angry that I went out and shot someone. And part three... Yes, yes. I do have to shoot something again. Christmas Eve Day! Highly disappointing. It's like everything else about this whole godforsaken holiday. Hey! <sighs> Fuck. My god. Michael Cimino's Heaven's Gate Blu ray! Santa kinda sorta does exist. Ding, 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 ding.